Good, John. Yes, sir. Good, we got house lights. Okay, and the reason for that is that, uh, before I forget, because I, I'm 69 now, and I get forgotten. Um, no excuse. I've got a few here, if you would like, I've, I've got um, the outline for the message this morning. So if you came in a little bit later, that's all right, but I'd like for you to have one of these. Could someone... Uh, Please volunteer to hand these out among those who raise their hand. If you don't have an outline but would like one, please raise your hand. And this gentleman right here will be sure to get you one. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Um, Today is December 13th, and there's two things that are good about that. One, it's not Friday the 13th. It's Sunday the other is that in just 18 days, 2020 is going to be history. <laughs> yeah. I wonder what 2021 is going to be. Yeah, no one really knows. Uh, for those of you that I didn't get to greet on the way in, um, my name is Cliff. You can call me Cliff or pastor or brother or anything else that you want. Accept late for dinner. This is my lovely wife, <laughs> Sherry, right on the front. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, brother. All right. Now, um, over the past week, Sherry's had a little challenge to her health. It was non-COVID flu Amen. symptoms for about three days. And uh, she's over all of that today. But if, if for some reason you feel skittish about that, then bump her elbow and don't shake her hand. <laughs> but, she, but she's okay because in three days, the uh, symptoms began to just disappear. And she began to be able to get some sleep and hold some food down. Amen. And I began, I, I, I'm not kidding, I knew that she was feeling better when I got up in the morning and the house st st stopped looking so much like a bachelor pad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and a little bit more, a little bit more like a home and that I had uh, come to know. I'm going to have to set this down a second and arrange some things so they're not awkward and fall on the floor. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Well, tomorrow is Monday, the, f the uh, 14th of December, and that begins the 12 days of Christmas. How many practices the 12 days of Christmas? That's what I thought. Oh, you do? Oh, my goodness. I just got a gift. They told me about it. I'm like, really? Yeah. Are you going to get a partridge in a pear tree tomorrow? I'm not going to get any socks. Just be your socks for each day. Do you believe that? Yeah, I don't believe it. Because this is the deal. When you listen, I figured it out this week, and I think I have the figures right. Over a period of 12 days, if you were to receive the set successive and increasing gifts on each day for the 12 days of Christmas, here's what you would receive by the, 12th, the end of the 12th day. 12 partridges, each nesting in a, in a pear tree. Uh, in a pear tree. So I don't know what you do with trot partridges is what they're good for, but I know that if you have 12 pears, pear trees, you could start an orchard. And you could sell the pears and maybe, you know, something. Here's another one. 22 turtle doves. I don't know. I haven't seen too many doves around here. Where we lived in Illinois uh, for many years, uh, all of our lives, the, it, it, seasonally, we would hear um, doves cooing around the house often. Around here, I've actually heard for the first time in my life recently the 
pooing, pooting of owls in the morning. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's just very interesting. Totally different sound. I got to live near wooded area in order to be in here. Yeah. Oh, really? yeah that's right. Okay. In addition to the partridges and the pear trees and the turtle doves, you will have received thirty French hens. <laughs> 30 French hens, so maybe you could change your last name to Tyson. <laughs> 36 calling birds. I don't know what a calling bird is. Does anyone know what a, I don't know. Now this one I'm into, because 40 gold rings. I'm all in. You can give me all the rest of that stuff as long as I get 40 gold rings. You will have received 42 geese, and every one of them is going to lay an egg. <laughs> and my prayer this morning is that in this message, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you'll let us know, right? Uh, <laughs> then there's uh, 42 maids, and every one of them is milking. That means they come with a cow or a goat. So you could start a herd of something that would produce meat and more milk and who oh, my goodness. Get yourself a Stetson and some good boots. Yeah, move to Texas. <laughs> uh, 36 ladies leaping. Wow. <laughs> what am I gonna do with 30? <laughs> did would they need a place to stay? <laughs> yeah. gonna, okay. And then, in addition to thir that, you'll get 30 lords a leaping. Yeah. 22 pipers piping. Now, last night we were, or not last, the night before last, we were in Mildura, and we saw Sky Scottish pipers marching down the street, blowing Scottish windpipes and playing Christmas music. Well, that's what you'd get, 22 people. And, oh, and in the end, you would also have 12 annoying drummers, hitting drums and your neighbors, that your neighbors might not appreciate. There you go, okay, okay. Now, the best part of 2020 is that it's almost over. Amen. And we can all hope to get back to normal, right? Maybe because no one really knows what normal is going to look like in the coming weeks and years because, you know, I, I don't know, I, I was born in 1951 and 1968 didn't look anything like 1958 or 1978 and, and uh, no one but God really knows what the future holds. Now might be a good time for us to pray for our country. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning we've come together to worship and honor your name, reverence your son, Jesus Christ. For you have hold in your hand our futures. The scripture tells us that you have decided before they are rolled every roll of the dice. Nothing happens that takes you by surprise. And we are comforted in the fact that your purpose drives everything that happens. And it all works together somehow for the good of those who love God and are called according to your purpose. And so this morning, now we turn our minds and hearts to the word of God and ask that your kingdom come in the United States of America and all over the world. And Father, before I close this prayer and, and we all agree and amen, I lift up Moses to you this morning and ask you, Lord, to be with him and his family as they go through great transition and move to a very snowy state and uh, take up residence and a new cause for Jesus Christ. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Has it occurred to you that no matter how much education that you get or preparation that you try to have, that life seems to happen at its own pace and always ha comes with the unexpected. Mm -hmm. 
to those who are uneducated and ill and ill prepared because they haven't done the best they can or been alert, then they suffer the most. And so I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's ill-gotten for us to seek and to dream and to hope and, and, and to have visions for life and for the future and dreams and hopes for our children and grandchildren. But life will always come in the unexpected details to which we will have to adapt for the current situation. And I always find comfort in Romans 8.28 knowing that the scripture says that in all things everything works to the, for the good for of those who, are, who love God and are called according to his purpose. That says to me that in all things God has a purpose for his glory. Nothing glorifies God more than when people come to Jesus Christ and surrender their lives to the Savior. Amen. In all things, God has a purpose. Number two, his purpose is to mold Christ within me as well as it is for Christ within me to be shared with others so that we can be fishers of men. It also tells me this, that his purpose is the driving force behind everything that happens. Not that he causes evil, but there are those things that, that he brings along as that, that are corrective, or that are difficult, and there are also those things that he allows from the evil one in order to come at, at correctively for, for the saints. So, look, in everything, everything works together for the good of those who love God called according to his purpose. And if, and if we will surrender to that, if we will simply believe that, no matter what, only good can come from that. And who knows? Maybe. Just, just maybe. You see those little children back there? Maybe one of them, or maybe one of you or myself will do something that will become wonderful today or someday that affects the lives of other people and changes the course of history. Before we get into scripture, I want to give you an example of that in history. I'm quite certain that none of you has heard of a man named Mitsuo Fujita and that you don't know the name of another man who is an American named Jacob Deshazer. <laughs> Mitsuo Fujita was the lead pilot for the Empire of Jan, Japan who took off from an aircraft carrier in the Pacific Ocean and flew over to, to Pearl Harbor. He was the first one to fly in and call down Tora, Tora, Tora. And 3,000 American lives were lost. Jacob DeShazer was a sailor on board one of those ships that sank to the bottom of Pearl, and he vowed in anger that he would get revenge on those who had done this and killed so many of his shipmates. And so Jacob DeShazer volunteered for hazardous duty. He wanted payback, and so he became a Doolittle Raider. Do you know what you know about Doolittle Raiders? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Took off big bombers from the deck of one of our aircraft carriers to return the favor, and they flew uh, about, a, I think, two dozen, two dozen B-25s over Tokyo and bombed it, and then had to land their planes in China. Jacob's plane went down early in China among the Japanese, and he was taken is a POW camp for, to a POW camp in Japan for the rest of the war. POW camps were much worse than German were POW camps, and he was tortured for nearly four years. But in the confines of a POW camp, in the belly of Japan, among his enemies, Jacob Deshaver 
surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And while he was there living in his own filth, God called him into the ministry and said, I want you to be a missionary. And he said, okay, where do you want me to go? He said, I want you to go home, prepare and come back to Japan and preach forgiveness to the Japanese. And God put a love in his heart for his captors. Oh, my goodness. So after, after we dropped two nuclear bombs, you know about those. After that, Japan was liberated, and he went home, got married, went to seminary, prepared his life, and came back to Japan. And in Japan, he began to preach on, 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 on platforms to literally thousands, thousands of Japanese whose country was wracked by war, and the only country in the world that's been hit by not one, but two nuclear bombs to this day. 80,000 people vaporized with the first one. one. And their king, who had, been, who had been a god, came out and said, I'm not a god. Their hopes, their dreams, their religion, everything was on the altar. And he was giving altar calls and hundreds were streaming in to accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And he ran into another man a Japanese fellow who somehow had become a Christian after Pearl Harbor and stood on the same platform as Jacob DeShazer and together they preached forgiveness. His name, what's Bitsio Fujita. Amen. The lead pilot who called down fire over Pearl Harbor and one of Doolittle's raiders, who returned the favor, both had encountered Christ somehow during the war. And together, they were calling Japan to Christ and from behind the same pulpit, standing on the same stage. And over time, Mitsuo Fujita sent two, not one, but two of his sons to university to get their education in the United States of America. You don't know what's going to happen next year. You don't know what's going to affect time and history or, or what good may come from the very bad that we think has, has devastated and it shouldn't be like this and people will be tempted to give up on God because so many things were bad or devastating or, or, or th they were not just not ideal. People shouldn't behave that way, so I shouldn't go to church. Hello? Right. Well, now, you know the rest of the story. And the least of us may be used by God to accomplish the impossible. Because nothing is impossible with God. Right. Jesus said these words, if, and I, re, I, I use the international version, I apologize, I don't have one of yours. But it'll be very similar. And in the words of Jesus Christ written in red, the Bible says, If you believe, you shall receive whatsoever you ask for in prayer. Amen. You know, the more I believe that, the more I ask and the more I get from God. Because the more I pray, the more I pray with his will. Another place, Jesus said, if you believe in me, greater things than these shall you do. Mm. Whoa, that's a, <laughs> that's a challenge. And the book of Acts says now to him, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more Amen. than you could ever even ask or imagine in your wildest dream, be glory in the church, I trust that you are making devotion in, in your life to prayer and to the word of God, your daily habit and experience. I, I truly hope so. Because if you're not, you're at, at, at least missing out on the best part of life, Amen. if not a whole lot more. 
In our text this morning, we're going to examine the life of a 15-year-old girl, just an ordinary gal, junior high school, freshman, uh, freshman in high school age, whose prayer life changed her life in the history of the whole world for the last 2,000 years on into the next millennium. And if you'll turn with me, or if we have the scripture on the on the screens for Luke 1, verse 26 to 35. If you have that, you can turn there. Luke 1, chapter, chapter 1, and verse 26. Okay, you ready? Okay, now pay careful attention to the language, even though your, the language might veer a little bit from the New International that you have. Um, we'll do our best to, to, to pay close attention to the language because it is key to everything we're going to examine this morning. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, careful, listen, read this carefully. Greetings, you are highly favored. Hmm. Now the word favor in the New Testament means grace. Please remember that as we read some more. The Lord is with you. Mary was troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid because, listen again, you have found favor with God. You know, there was another person in Scripture in the Old Testament that God said, you found favor with God. And his name was Noah. Built the ark. You will be with child. Then he said two things to her that were life-changing and history-making. One, you will be with child. That's going to change her life. Especially because she wasn't married yet. Two, he will be great. Okay. You, you will be with child and give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus and he will be great and called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of David forever and his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the Most High will overshadow you and the one born in you will be called the Son of God. Now there has always been a great deal of discussion and much controversy over the life, the substance of Mary. We're not going to get into the controversy. What we want to get into is what the scriptures say. There you go. Yeah. And I want to ask you, quite literally, the, just some simple questions. From the language of the scripture, is it apparent that Mary understands that she's going to be get, uh, she's going to be present? She'll be pregnant as a virgin. She understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Does she understand that the one born in her will be the Son of God? Yeah. Yes. See, a lot of people, the, the, the controversy is over how much she understood and whether or not she could accept it and all these things. Sure. And even if she had some sinless life, which she did not because she was like you and me. The, um, you know, she knew all those things. She didn't know everything. She didn't know he was going to die on the cross before her very eyes. Hmm. You know. All I know is this, that this ordinary girl 
had an extraordinary devotion to the Lord. And that if there was not, and if she was just an ordinary girl, any one of us can have what she had as well, and that's an extraordinary devotional life to Christ. As a matter of fact, what was extraordinary, what seems extraordinary ought to be ordinary in our lives because we daily draw close to God Amen. in his spirit Amen. and become overwhelmed, overshadowed, and <coughs> overcome by his power. See, we know that she was saved because the scripture says that she was highly favored. She had grace in her life. The word favor means grace. It's a free gift. And Ephesians tells us that for it is by grace that we are saved through faith in, in that this is not of yourselves, it's a gift from God. Mary's prayer life produced great things, starting with her own salvation because she was trusting the God who would be born in her womb. He was her Lord. Number one, on your outline, if you're taking those notes on the outlines, uh, if you don't have a pen or pencil, nudge the lady next to you because they have purpose purses for a reason. I don't, in math class, I always like to sit next to a girl because if I didn't forget my pencil, I knew who to ask. You know? And they would grudgingly give me one. Let me have it back at the end of class. I'd say, okay. Number one. Here's what is extraordinary. This is what made Mary, her life and changing history so extraordinary. Mary had a ready spirit. She had a ready spirit. What do you mean, Pastor Cliff? I mean that Mary was ready for God to do something wonderful in her life. She had an expectation when she got up in the morning and when she made her way into the room, wherever that she had her Bible and her, and her, her prayer journal waiting for her, that whenever she got into that prayer closet or that hideaway during, and spent time alone with the Lord, something wonderful was going to happen, whether or not she felt it. And I'm sure that many times she did. She loved God more than anything and she, in prayer, gave him everything. She wanted God to replicate the miracles that she knew of in the Old Testament scriptures in her own life. Things like the, the plagues of, of uh, the Exodus and, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, the promised land and in the parting of the Red Sea, she believed God could do anything. And so when he showed up and said, I want, <laughs> I want you to take this assignment from me. Guys, let, let, God, she was ready. She was ready for God to do something in her life. When she prayed, Mary expected God to show up. Amen. And she was, imp she was possessed, listen to this, she was possessed by the realization that God had a purpose for her life that no one else in this world could fulfill. Now, if you pray enough, you're going to get that. If you don't, you won't. And Christianity will just be a bunch of rules and, and hope to help you live a better life and be a kinder person and, and get to heaven. I'm not here to sell you fire insurance. What I want to do is call you to higher living. Amen. Mary had a ready spirit. Amen. Number two on your outline. Mary had a listening ear. Mm. In prayer, Mary resisted the temptation to do all the talking or to tell God about all of her needs and give him the shopping list of all that needed to happen in her life and, 
and, and her expectations and wants and things, but rather she listened for him to speak with his still small voice and she had grown accustomed to the sound. So she recognized him when he spoke to her heart. Does that make sense? Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Mary was experiencing the fullness of God in her life because she offered herself to God without reservation, without restraint. She was holding nothing back, <laughs> not even her body mm. or her fiancé or her family or anything else. And by, listen, by an act of her will, she gave herself away to God for him to use. That's because prayer is the language of faith. And pray, faith, is, faith is the money we spend in heaven to get what we need from God. Faith is the hand of a beggar reaching up to God and asking for a crust of bread, holding up an empty cup as you're dying in the desert and saying, give me a drink. Mary was ready for the Spirit of God to do something in her life. And she didn't know what. She listened intense, intently for the Spirit to speak so that she would hear him with her heart. And number three on your outline, Mary had open eyes. She was not naive. The scripture tells us that she knows she knew what being a virgin was and it was impossible for her to become pregnant unless she had slept with somebody or God did a miracle. And the angel said, God wants to do a miracle. What, 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 what? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that it'll just be that way. So she just had to trust him for the rest. My favorite worship chorus, or at least one of them, is open my eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And uh, to see you high and lifted up. People who spend, t listen, this is a proven fact, and I've read it many times in different issues of Time Magazine and Newsweek. People of faith who spend time daily in the presence of God live longer. Amen. Amen. People who, of faith who love Jesus live better with a greater sense of fulfillment. And they are more resilient and able to bounce back back from serious setbacks like the loss of a job or bankruptcy, the death of loved ones, and, and your faith still is the money that's still good in heaven. Amen. In spite of all the complexities that would occur in Mary's life, because of her new assignment, she swallowed hard. She said, yes, sir. You can count on me, sir. I'll go anywhere, and I'll do anything for you, sir. Amen. She trusted to God that God would work all the details out, like, <laughs> how is she going to explain this to Joseph? <laughs> Well, she didn't have to because the Holy Spirit revealed it to him in a dream and he accepted it before she spoke to him. Amen. See, when you God, he goes before you and he's and he's got he's got and he's got your sex. So she didn't have to worry she found out she didn't have to worry about how how would you like to be a fifteen year old girl? in first century Israel and have to tell your father that you're pregnant or that you're going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That would be a tough one. 
You don't have to worry about it because it only happened once. It's not going to happen again. Right? Mary, Lord, Mary. Okay? But she had to trust God for all of those details. She had to trust God for all of those complexities. That he would take care of it all. And that's why, number four on your outline. This is really key, folks. It's key to it all. Mary had it's not me. <laughs> Mary had a willing heart. Mary had a willing heart. Mary had a willing heart. How about you this morning? Are you willing to give him everything, to, to lay it all on the altar like a living sacrifice and don't crawl off? Listen to this. I've been a Christian since 1972 and a pastor for almost 40 of those years. When most people say they're not ready, what they mean is they are not willing to surrender, to give him everything, to let him have control. Jesus said, he who finds his life will surely lose it. Mm -hmm. But he that loses his life for my sake will surely find it. Amen. If you haven't already, my prayer is that today you will find life in Jesus Christ or repair the relationship that once was stronger than it has been lately. Listen, if you want a better life, pray to the Lord. Amen. If you want to live in a better country, if you want to live in a kinder and gentler world, give your life away to the Lord and offer yourself a living sacrifice and ask him to make you a fisher of men. Amen. If you want to see a church that will flourish in this place and fill pews to overflowing, <clears throat> to be able to overcome every obstacle that it has to face without the ups and downs, the peaks and the valleys, but a, but a church that it might take, might be slow, but that it will grow, not because people from other churches are coming, but because you have discovered portions of the population of Leesburg and the surrounding area that need Jesus, Amen. and you are reaching out to them, and they are coming to Christ and getting wet in that tub. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If you want to live, in, if you want a better life, give it away. The problem is you're holding on to it. Your fingers need to be peeled back so that he can have it. Now let's look at, at Luke chapter 1 and verse 46. And here's why. After Mary said yes to God, and she was already pregnant with the Savior in her womb, she went to see her aunt. And here's, and, and when they rejoiced together with what God was doing, Mary sang a song, and she sang these words. She, she, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. And from now, listen, from now on, every generation is going to call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers and thrones, and he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. Amen. How many 
many times in that did she say I? Never. How many times did she say him or he? You see, because it's all about Jesus. Amen. And when you make your life all about Jesus, you will be filled with joy and an immense sense of purpose. And that whether it's good or it's bad or the things that come at you are that threaten to destroy you, you will know in your heart that all things are working together for you because you love God and you're called according to his purpose. You're a soldier of the almighty God and one of you will put a hunter to flight. This isn't a small group. It's not even a small church. This is a place, this is a, this is a, a, a landing space for the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is work in people's lives. Amen. Yeah. Mary was not feeling sorry for herself, was she? Oh, God. God called me to be the mother of Jesus. Can you believe it? <laughs> what would you do? How many women would respond that way? Probably most of the people that we know, because their hearts have not been made tenderized by prayer in the presence of God, would probably come to God with our selfish motives, because that's how we are. Yeah. But when our heart is tenderized by him, it's a completely different story. She's not talking about me. She's talking about he. How about you? Are you ready to let the Holy Spirit and expect him to do something great in your life in this place? Will you listen with your the ear of your heart for the still small voice and recognize it when he speaks? And even if you are afraid of it, like Mary was, let him say to your fears, peace, be still. Amen. It's time to open your eyes and with a willing heart say yes to God. Let's bow. Father, in this holiday season, and in the midst of the beginning of the first pastoral transition of this church, leaders and followers wondering what's going to happen next, what will the pastor be like, what will church life be? What will, our, what will form the substance of our vision and who will we reach out and who will respond? And will, Father, I ask you to calm our hearts and our fears and call us to an altar of prayer. And so, Lord, I'm going to ask you right now that by the same spirit that came upon Mary and overshadowed her, the same mighty arm that, 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 that created himself in her, he will speak to our hearts and create faith within us. And before anybody opens their eyes or responds to music or even to me that you will, by the show of your hand, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and you need to begin to say yes to God, you'll raise your hand and ask for prayer. I see hands. You. Thank you. Two hands. Thank you. Any other? I want to I make a difference. 
I don't know if the world's going to get better. But I do know I want to make a difference. I don't want to be the domino that gets pushed over by the one ahead of me. I want to be the moving force. I want my faith to be creative. And I want to live a life that forms Christ in others, that helps them to see with open eyes, listen to the Spirit with open ears, and be willing with their mind to say yes to Jesus. Father, I'm also praying for this congregation coming weeks, coming months. Whatever the time that it takes for the transition that the revelation of your will will become apparent and it will not only be smooth but together we will rejoice amen Oh, no. All right. So, again, thank you. We thank you for the word that you've brought us. We thank you for willingly coming to our church and delivering God's word faithfully, truthfully, and not throwing in your opinions and your ideas and sticking to God and what he has taught us. So we thank you. Uh, now we're going to move into um, offering. So please, church, bow your heads. If you're new 